Hi there. Okay, I'm going to give you in this video a bit of background on um, the Ramsey paper that we're reading this week. Um, so first of all, just from the beginning here, we'll notice here's a table of contents. We have five sections. The frequency theory, Mr. Kane's theory, degrees of belief, logic of consistency, logic of truth. Um, I said on the syllabus, I want you to skip section two. Um, Here's why. Okay, our concern in this class is with um, what sort of a thing belief is, right? How we uh, interpret different notions of belief. For this week in particular, we're focusing on a, a sort of a shift from binary, on, off, all or nothing conceptions of belief to degreed notions of belief, where belief comes sort of on a spectrum. And Ramsey's gonna introduce us to this kind of idea. Now, Ramsey's emphasis in this paper or sort of his starting point um, is not the same as ours. So the way Ramsey frames what he's doing, at least at the beginning, is about uh, interpretations of probability. So uh, just to say why I'm having you skip section two, uh, section two here is uh, criticism of a rival theory of probability that um, I, for the purposes of this class, it's not your, worth your time getting up to speed on Keynes's theory of probability so that you can understand Ramsey's criticisms. More important for us is going to be in the following section, section three, where he says, uh, here's another way, a different theory, a different way of interpreting probability statements that has to do with degrees of belief. So don't worry about Keynes's theory. But let me give you a bit of background on why we'd be worried about interpreting probability statements. So um, first of all, Probability statements um, show up in lots of places, um, in science, in uh, uh, gambling, in uh, predicting all kinds of uncertainty, right? You'll often hear, like on the weather report, they'll say there's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow. You might wonder, what does that mean? It doesn't mean it's going to rain 60% of the time tomorrow. It means something like, well, actually, this is kind of challenging. This is difficult. Um, let, me, let me suggest here are a couple of different things, generally speaking, um, that we might have in mind when we talk about probability. And uh, Ramsey's probably expecting his audience to have this sort of thing um, in the back of their minds, uh, the audience that he is delivering this paper to. I should say this, was, this paper was delivered as a talk in Cambridge. It was only published in the form that we've got now after Ramsey's death. He died very young. Um, that's not super important for you, but that's why sometimes I'm going to talk about delivering a talk rather than writing a paper. Okay, so here's one thing you might mean. Um, here's a normal thing to say. T think of a, a six-sided die, right? Like the dice you get with any kind of a game. Um, suppose the die is equally weighted. It's a fair die. That means something like every face of the die from one to six has an equal chance of showing up on any roll. Okay, what do we mean when we say there's an equal chance? That's a, that's a probability statement. If I'm saying the probability of getting a one is one in six, getting a two, one in six, any one of these things is one in six. So whatever percentage that is. 17%? Something like that. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. What do I mean when I say there's an equal chance? Well, one standard way to understand this, and this is where the title of this first section of the paper, the frequency theory, comes from. You might just think, well, what we mean when we say there's a one in six chance of a one coming up is, well, if you roll the die a whole lot of times, many, 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 many times, we expect to, we expect about one-sixth of those times to be ones. Roughly speaking, it don't, we don't mean exactly, and we do mean like in the long run, you're going to get about a one-sixth proportion or frequency of outcomes. How frequently does a one come up? One-sixth of the time in the long run. Okay. The trouble with that interpretation of probability statements is it doesn't always make sense because, well, here's one problem. We sometimes give probability statements or make probability claims about events that are one-offs, 
right? So if I say there's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow, I don't mean that over the course of the next year, right? How, how are we going to get a, something like rolling the die many, many times? Tomorrow is only going to happen once. There's only going to be one 29th of September 2020. So what's the frequency that a frequency theory could be talking about? That's an initial problem. Okay. Um, so one way of addressing something like that, uh, and I'll, I'll be brief here, something, something like the approach that Keynes was taking would be to say, well, when we talk about probability statements, when we say there's this chance of rain tomorrow, what we mean is there's a certain logical relation, an objective logical relation between, let's say, the evidence that we have about rain tomorrow or about the physical conditions now and how, uh, how likely those conditions make it that it's going to rain tomorrow. Okay, so we think, of, we think there of probability as telling you about some kind of logical connection between some evidence or some physical conditions or something like that and the proposition that you're interested in. Okay. That kind, of, um, that kind of interpretation of probability, that sort of probability theory as a, a theory of a logical relation um, has been attractive to a lot of uh, very clever philosophers um, over the years. Now, the standard complaint for that kind of theory is just that it, it's very hard to work out what that logical theory would be. Um, I'm, I, I'm trying to just give you a, a thumbnail sketch here, but usually, so the objection to the frequency theory is that it doesn't seem to apply to all the cases where we'd want to make probability statements. The objection to the logical type theories is basically that all of the actual worked out logical theories don't quite do what you want them to do. They all run into problems. Um, they would be able to deal with these one-off sort of cases if you're just saying there's a logical relation between our evidence and a, a certain possible outcome, a certain proposition that isn't certain yet. That, that'll apply to one-off cases just as much as repeated long-run kinds of things. Um, but yeah, if the details don't work, then the theory is no good. And it's not, it, again, for this class, it's not super important what those kinds of problems are. And I mean, there are uh, philosophers working today who think we can fix it. <laughs> Maybe we'll be able to do it. Um, a lot of people have, have thought uh, because of the cleverness of some of the people who really worked very hard on it. One of the names you hear a lot here is Rudolf Carnap. Um, really excellent philosopher, went, uh, tried very, worked very hard on coming up with a well worked out logical theory of probability, but the consensus is it just didn't quite work in this has led a lot of people to think, you know, if Carnap couldn't do it, then it can't be done. Not everybody thinks that no philosophical theory is ever completely dead. It might work out in the end. Okay. Those are two main kinds of interpretation, frequency, logical interpretation. Here's a third one, and this is the kind of thing that Ramsey's going for. <clears throat> He's going to say, there's a subjective interpretation of probability statements. The subjective interpretation says something like, well, when we say there's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow, I mean something like I'm 60% confident that's going to happen. And maybe we can sort of fudge a bit and say, um, you know, when the meteorologist tells us um, there's a 60% chance of rain, they don't just mean they personally are confident. They mean something like uh, anybody who is um, well-trained and responsive to the evidence and something like that should be 60% confident. Maybe we get something like that. But the kind of thing that Ramsey is going to do here is say, um, you know, we can use probability statements as a way of generalizing that all or nothing kind of uh, belief that we've been talking about in this class. So uh, let me skip ahead to some of that stuff. I'm not going to go through um, all of his arguments in detail here because you're going to read the paper. But okay, so he starts talking about 
The subject of our inquiry is the logic of partial belief, so degrees of belief, something that's not the full all or nothing kind of thing, but comes in parts. He does some talking about what it could mean for you to have part of a belief, a fraction of a belief, something like that. The sort of thing he's going to emphasize, the sort of thing he's going to talk about is methods of measuring belief. So as he says here, it wouldn't be very enlightening to be told that you should be, let's say, two thirds confident, 67% confident that it's going to rain tomorrow, unless we know what it means to have two thirds of a belief, a 67% confidence in something. So what he's gonna to try to do here is give us a theory that tells you, here's how you can understand those kinds of statements. Here's what it means to be two thirds confident or any other proportion confident that something is going to happen or have two thirds of a belief or any other proportion of a belief. Okay, you're going to read that argument. You're going to read his arguments against rival possibilities. The only thing, uh, the only other thing I'm going to do here in this video is talk you through some of the mathsy stuff because I can understand if that becomes difficult. So here's a passage that starts looking mathsy. Um, I will talk through this passage in one second. Let me give you a bit of background. So here's a key idea that um, will be familiar to uh, some of you who've, who are in the PPE program. If you've taken some economics modules, you will definitely have run into the concept of expected value. And this is the thing that's driving um, Ramsey's innovation here, his, his uh, means of measuring the degree of a belief. So for those of you who haven't done economics modules, let me talk you through the basic idea. So let's come over here to this whiteboard thing. Okay, imagine you're in a situation where you have a choice between two or more, let's do two to keep things simple, two or more different choices. So I've labeled those over here as A or B. And also there's some proposition P, some thing that you're not sure about. So I'm Marking down, so we've got rows on this chart to represent your different choices. We've got columns to represent different ways the world might be. Either P is true or it isn't true. So either P or not P. And in the boxes, these four boxes, I want you to imagine what I'm writing in here is how good, how valuable it would be for you to do choice A if P is true. Value two is how good choice A would be for you if P is false. So if not P is true, and likewise, value three, if choice B is true, sorry, if you take choice B and P is true, value four, if you take choice B and P is false. So we're, in the scenario I'm imagining here, we're saying something like you've got two choices, A or B, those are the only choices you could take. And the only things that are, the only uh, thing that makes a difference to um, how good things turn out for you uh, on this choice are this proposition P, is it true or is it false? So maybe choices A and B, if we think of P as something like it rains tomorrow, right? I'm not sure whether it rains, whether it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, maybe it will, maybe it won't. And let's say my the choice I'm looking at is, you know, take my umbrella or don't take my umbrella. Well, if it does rain and I take my umbrella, that's okay. If it doesn't rain and I take my umbrella, that's a little worse, maybe, because um, I'm stuck with this umbrella that isn't doing anything for me. Or maybe, you know, the absence of rain is just so good for me that this is better altogether. Um, on the other hand, if it does rain and I don't take my umbrella, that's bad. I get all wet, everything's sad. Um, if it doesn't rain and I don't have my umbrella, well, maybe that's the best of all possibilities, right? Okay. Let me tell you about the standard theory that tells you how to decide whether to do A or B in a situation like this. The standard theory says, calculate the expected value. I'll define that in a second. Calculate the expected value of each choice of A and B and pick the one with the higher expected value. So here's how this works. We say to calculate the expected value of A, we look at all the different possible values we might get if we do choice A multiply each of them by the probability that that's the value that comes out and then add those up. So to get the expected value of A, I take the probability that P is true times 
value one, that is how good it would be for me to be in box one, the one where I do choice A and P is true. And then I add the probability of not P times value two. Okay, expected value of B, likewise the probability that P is true times value three, because that's the one for if P is true and I do choice B, plus the probability of not P times value four. Okay, standard um, decision theory tells you if you have a situation where you can draw up a chart like this and you can actually calculate the expected values of A and B, then we should do these sums and pick whichever thing is better. Pick whichever thing is better more of the time. Um, let's try doing an example with uh, actual numbers in here, um, just because that might be easier for you. So first of all, I have to tell you what the probabilities of P and not P are. I guess a second ago I said, imagine the chance of rain is 60%. Um, so let's say the probability of P is 0. 0.6. And that means the probability of not P is 0. 0.4, 40%. Okay, those are our probabilities. Um, let's say choice A, let's say that means you take your umbrella, choice B is no umbrella. Okay, what should these values be then? Well, maybe we'll say the best case is if you have no umbrella and it doesn't rain, nobody likes rain, right? So let's say that's worth like 10 goodness. What do these units mean? Just something, suppose we can measure this. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, what about if I take, I don't take my umbrella and it does rain, that sounds like the worst thing. Right, so let's call that uh, minus 10. So we get 10 units of goodness if it's sunny and I have no umbrella, I lose, I have negative 10 units of goodness if um, I don't take my umbrella and it does rain. Okay, if I do take my umbrella and it rains, um, that's definitely better than no umbrella and rain. Um, Let's call that, let's say that's worth, I mean, I, I'm still miserable when it rains, but at least I've got my umbrella. Let's call it like minus one. Maybe that's the power of umbrellas. Um, value two, so this is where I take my umbrella, but it doesn't rain. Let's imagine that's, well, let's see, it should be worse than if I, uh, worse than the best case, worse than no rain and no umbrella. Should be worse than that. But, you know, I like the sun enough. I don't mind carrying my umbrella that much, let's say this is worth five units. I'm just making up these numbers. Uh, the point is to see how the calculations would change if we put in different numbers, right? Okay, so let's say I still get five units. You know, just the, the fact of having to carry my umbrella around all day makes it five units worse than the best case. Um, but still the lack of rain makes it much better than the case where I have my umbrella and it rains. Okay, in that case, okay, so expected value of A then the probability of P we said is 0.6, so 0.6 times value one, that's negative one, plus the probability of no rain, that's 0.4 times value two, that's five. Expected value of B, that's the probability of P, so 0.6 times value three, that's minus 10 plus the probability of not P, that's 0.4 times 10, value four. Okay, if we calculate these out, 0.6 times minus one, that's uh, minus, oops, minus 0.6, plus four times, 0.4 times five, that's two, so we get 1.4 unless I've made a mistake, but I guess I can edit that if I need to. Okay, expected value of B, that's 0.6 times minus 10, so that's minus six, plus 0.4 times 10, that's four, so that's an expected value of minus two. 
So expected value of A is 1.4, expected value of B is minus two. So since the expected value of A is bigger than the expected value of B, standard theory tells you, you should do A. Okay. Okay, but if the probabilities look different, even if these facts about how valuable I think it is to have my umbrella or not, depending on whether it is or isn't raining, um, if I just change the probabilities, I might get a different verdict on whether it's better for me to take my umbrella or not, right? So the way we have it here, we said, it's better for me to take my umbrella than not. Taking the umbrella that was A was worth 1.4. Expected value B had an expected value of minus two. But if I say it's a whole lot less likely that it's gonna rain, then things will change. So let's say I've only got point, I think it's 10% likely to rain. So 90% likely that it won't rain. So then we have in here 0.1 times value one, 0.9 times five, so then this is uh, what? 0.1 times minus one, that's negative 0 0.1. 0 0.9 times five, that's 4.5. So here we have 4.4. Expected value of A has gone up, but if I've done this right, the expected value of B is gonna go up even more. So this is now likelihood of rain is only 0.1. Likelihood of no rain, or the probability of no rain is 0.9. So 0.1 times minus 10, that's only uh, minus one. 0.9 times 10, times 10, that's nine. So we have here an expected value of eight. Nine minus one, that's eight. So now leaving the umbrella behind looks better. Okay. And likewise, you can mess around with some of these numbers if you like. Um, if you change the values, for each outcome, how how happy you'd be, how unhappy you'd be, how much you'd benefit from um, having an umbrella in the rain, having no umbrella in the rain, having an umbrella with no rain, having no umbrella with no rain. Um, that can make a difference to which option looks better according to standard kinds of decision theory. Okay. Now, we've been talking about probabilities here. What are those things? Are they frequencies? Probably not, right? If we're talking about as Ramsey is, if we're talking about like psychologically, what makes you decide that one of these choices is better than the other, what makes it look preferable for you to pick one choice over the other, it's going to be about how confident you are that P is true, right? If you think P is very likely, then you're going to make choices that look better in the case where P is likely, if uh, P looks very unlikely otherwise. Okay, so this example Ramsey gives also works, uh, makes a lot of sense if we're thinking in expected value terms. So here's the, here's the example he describes. Okay, let's give an instance of the sort of case which might occur. Okay, imagine I'm at a crossroads and don't know the way, but I rather think one of the two ways is right. So I decide I'll go that way, but keep my eyes open for someone to ask. So I'm on one of these roads it's either right or wrong. Um, my plan is I'm gonna go until I see someone to ask. If now I see someone half a mile away over the fields, whether I turn aside to ask him will depend on a few things. The relative inconvenience of going out of my way to cross the fields or of continuing on the wrong road if it's the wrong road, right? So the balance between how annoying it's gonna to be to go and ask the person versus just stay on this road and hope it's the right one but also how confident I am that I'm right. And clearly he says, the more confident I am of this, the less distance I should be willing to go from the road to check my opinion. If I'm very sure that I'm already on the right road, then like if somebody's on the road, I'll ask them, hey, is this the right way? But if I see there's somebody like way far over there and like I'm gonna get all muddy if I go through these fields to go and check with that person, it's gonna take me a long time to walk over there. I'm gonna say, eh, I'm probably right. I don't need to check. But if I'm really unsure, then I'm going to be more willing to go farther to go and ask somebody. I'm going to be willing to put more effort in to get someone to give me the right answer if I'm less sure that I've already got the right answer. Okay. Ramsey proposes, therefore, to use the distance I would be prepared to go to ask as a measure of the confidence of my opinion. The farther I'm willing to go, the less confident I am. 
the less distance I'm willing to go to check the answer, the more confident I am. Okay, and what I've said above explains how this is to be done. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to use these definitions here to set, set up uh, the expected value framework we had before. So suppose the disadvantage of going x yards to ask is f of x. The advantage of arriving at the right destination is r. The advantage of arriving at the wrong one is w. He's going to argue in a second in a very expected value-y kind of way that the degree of my belief that I'm on the right road is given by this amount with p for a probability if I'm just barely willing to go a distance d to ask. Let's work this out step by step. Okay, let's just start with these definitions and set up our framework. So let me delete some of this stuff from before. So the two actions we're looking, we're considering here are no longer taking an umbrella or not taking an umbrella, but rather uh, checking or not checking. So just continue, continuing. Just stay on the road or go ask the person. Okay, what are these values going to be? Well, oh, sorry, I should also change. The proposition we're looking at is not whether it'll rain, but am I on the right path? or on the wrong path. Okay. Let's just say the probability I'm on the right path is, I don't know what it is, let's just call it some number p. In that case, the probability that I'm on the wrong path is gonna be whatever's left over, right? So it's one minus p, just because that's how probabilities work. Okay. All right. Now, if I go and check, if I go and ask somebody whether I'm on the right path or not, there's a cost. The cost is f of x, whatever the distance is to go and ask that person. Okay, And that cost is there whether I'm on the right path or the wrong path. Okay. On the other hand, if I continue, here's what the the little r, little w are doing for us. Ramsey says, if I'm on the right path, let's suppose the benefit of that is r. If I'm on the wrong path, the benefit of being on that path is w. Maybe you're saying to yourself, being on the wrong path should have a, a, a disadvantage rather than an advantage. Well, then w is going to be a negative number. Okay. Now, if I am already on the right path, actually, sorry, if I go and check, then whether I'm on the right path or the wrong path now, the, the person I ask will put me on the right path. So either way, I'm going to get the benefit of R, right? The benefit R of getting on the right path, getting to the right destination, but I'm going to uh, lose the cost of checking. So here's the framework. What's the expected value of checking? Well, it's going to be P, that's the probability of being right, times r minus f of x plus 1 minus p times r minus f of x. Okay. But we can see in either case, I'm getting the same benefit. So once we do this sum, we're going to find the expected value of checking is just that benefit you're definitely going to get, r minus f of x. On the other hand, the expected value of continuing is p times r plus p times, sorry, plus 1 minus p times w. Right, The probability that we're in the right-hand column times the value we get there plus p, probability we're in the left-hand column, times this thing. Okay. Now, okay, that's the expected value of each thing. That's the kind of calculation that Ramsey's doing when we move down in a second. So the, w the way this passage is structured, he, tell he makes these definitions and then he says, here's the answer we're going to get. The probability, my confidence in this thing, is given by this amount and then he tells you why that should be so. So if you get to this equation and you say, I don't see why that happens, that's fine. You're not expected to. 
So, okay, how does this get us to uh, measurement of your uh, degree of confidence? Well, okay, let's come back to where he makes his calculation. So he says, remember that this value D is supposed to be the distance you're just willing to go to check uh, uh, whether you're on the right road. So just willing to go. What's going to be a situation where you're just barely willing to go? Well, it's going to be a situation where the expected value of checking is about the same as the expected value of not checking, right? If the expected value of checking is clearly higher, then you'll definitely be willing to go and check. If it's clearly lower, then you'll definitely not be willing to check. If they're about the same, then we'll say, ah, you're maybe just barely willing to check, or you're sort of like, can't decide which one to do. So that's what Ramsey does. He'll say, try taking these two expected value calculations, set them equal to each other, right? Let's replace x with a value d and say, when you get these two sides of the equation equal to each other, that's the value d. And then he does some rearranging. We can solve this equation for p and say, here's what p must be. Okay, if we, if we know that you're just barely willing to go a distance d, that must be the distance where these two expected values are about the same. And if we know what r and w are, and we know what d is, then we can use this kind of equation to figure out what p has to be. And that's where this equation comes from. Okay, he goes through this explanation of how he does this thing. Then at the end, he gets, okay, if we set these two things equal, then we must have this equation, right? Rearranged, it looks like the thing we just said above. Okay, what is the calculation that he does here? Well, he figures out, he doesn't say, I'm gonna do the expected value, which like I said, this is the thing that you would standardly learn in like an economics class or, or something like that. Nowadays, when we teach probability, you learn this stuff right away. Um, instead, he does, he talks about the sort of thing that motivates why uh, decision theorists recommend using expected value. He says, not imagine you make the decision once and we look at the expected value he instead says imagine you had to do the same thing a whole bunch of times n times where n could be whatever number you want and then we'll add up what's going to be the total benefit from each choice if you had to do the same thing a whole lot of times so imagine p is the, pro the probability we talked about the proportion of cases where you're on the right path then we say well if you've done this thing n times then the total benefit you're going to get is the number of times that, that we run this thing times, the percentage of those, P is the percentage of those where um, you're on the right path, times R, the benefit of being on the right path, plus the number of times, N, times one minus P, the percentage of times where you're not on the right path, times W, the benefit of being on the wrong path. Okay, and we can likewise add up the um, total benefit of checking every time. That's going to involve the benefit of being on the right path minus the cost of walking x yards to check. But if you look at these expressions, right, npr plus n1 minus pw, nr minus n times fx, that looks just like these expressions that we had for expected value times n, right? If I put an n here and an n here and an n here and an n here, those are exactly the things Ramsey had. So these are n times the expected value of checking and n times the expected value of continuing. So this is part of the motivation for something like expected value reasoning about choices to make. We say, well, if you had to do the same thing a whole bunch of times, over and over and over again in a series so that we can start talking about frequencies, then here's the total benefit you would get from doing that thing. And then you might want to think, it makes sense to do the thing that would give you the most total benefit in the long run. But then if we just divide out the actual number of times in the sequence, we get expected value. So that's what's going on 
in this passage from Ramsey. It's basically expected value calculations. We try setting the, the two expected values equal to each other, and that gives us a way to work backwards to figure out the probability that must be involved. Okay, that's the general kind of approach Ramsey has to um, determining what somebody's degrees of confidence are. If we can look at a bunch of different choices that they would make and say, here's what they're willing to do, here's what they're not willing to do, it turns out, given some additional assumptions, um, Ramsey uh, proves what's called a representation theorem. So this is something where we say, assuming that your preferences, the choices you would make have certain properties, certain they're in certain ways well behaved, then we can represent you, we can represent your choices by a probability distribution, a set of probabilities and a set of values or utilities that make sense of those choices, that make your choices maximize expected value, expected utility, according to those probabilities. So this gives us a way of, you know, instead of having to like ask people, how confident are you? Give us a number. Uh, how, how much do you think it's going to rain tomorrow or something like that? Uh, we can look at the, the choices that people are willing to make. We can sort of read back off the, the uh, preferences they have or the choices they would make, how confident they must be. I'm going to leave it there. There are going to be more mathematical details in here that you might find difficult. I would encourage you to, if you get stuck or if something just looks impenetrable, um, feel free to send me questions. Um, I absolutely would like to explain these things to anybody who wants to. But if you get stuck, also feel free to move ahead because um, there is, there's maths in here, but there's more philosophy that happens after it. And you definitely want to be there for the philosophy. Okay.